Should have stayed where the signs I ignored. Can I help you not to hurt anymore? We saw brilliance when the world was asleep. Say, who cares if one more light goes out in the sky of a million stars? It flickers, flickers. Who cares when someone's time runs out? If a moment this all we are, we're quicker, quicker. Who cares if one more light goes out? A while back, I told Andreas Moss that if he ever needed an illustration for his antinatalism magazine project, I'd be willing to help. So he took me up on it, and this video will be the making of the cover for issue number three, as well as a discussion about its subjects and inspiration. Jai Woon Huang, who died recently, was the original creator of the magazine. He was featured in an interview in issue number two, and number three will have a tribute to him. It was Andreas who suggested that I have Jai Woon on the cover. He said maybe you, he could be looking down on some antinatalist scene. That's a very common trope in comic books, uh, to have a face or head and shoulders uh, looking down on something, so I immediately started to get ideas. I was also inspired especially to draw a bridge from Jai Woon's cover for Brokerage and His Murder, The Scream by Edvard Munch. I decided that the story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, would make a good subject as these kinds of drawings usually feature a road of some kind. Originally I wanted to have antinatalists walking away from the viewer, with natalists walking towards us. Uh, however, I realized that if I did that, I wouldn't be able to show the city of Omelas in the background, so I flipped it. By having the antinatalists popping a balloon, I could then have the family to look back at us so we could see everyone's faces. I'm not going to show the entire process of this illustration because then this video would be three hours long, even sped up. So I'll just be showing the very end of it. The pencil stage is always the longest. I had to take photographs of myself for reference and find reference of cities, flowers, and a ferris wheel, etc. I used the white city of the Chicago Columbian Exposition as inspiration for Omelas, uh, mixed with the modern Chicago skyline. The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas is a short story by science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin. It was written in 1973 and has since become a way to introduce school children to utilitarian ethics. That's how I first read the story when I was a kid in school. It is interesting that the story is so widely taught, yet the adults who teach it don't really seem to be very influenced by it. Especially when you consider that it's about a scapegoat, and animals certainly fulfill that role in our modern society. It's a good metaphor for antinatalism, and that's why many of us talk about it. The gist of the story is that there's a utopia where all of the citizens' needs are taken care of. There's no stress, no work, no disease. However, the price for all of that comfort is that one child must be tortured, living in his or her own filth, with no love or attention. Everyone in the utopia knows that the child is there, and they learn to accept it. But a few never can accept it, and so instead of destroying the city by rescuing the child, they simply leave. So there are a lot of ways to interpret the story. You can look at it from the vegan perspective. We know that we cannot rescue the animals. It's simply impossible unless we had an army that could challenge the police and the armed forces. So all we can do is boycott and protest their torture. Or from an antinatalist perspective, the only way to stop natalists would be to kill them. So again, we have no other option but to simply walk away from their way of life. Politically, I can also relate. If I have no other choice than a Republican or a Democrat, then my only real choice is to walk away and not vote. But really, it's best as a metaphor for negative utilitarianism. 
It demonstrates how worthless happiness is, even for a great number, if it has to be at the expense of another's suffering. The pain of one child has more value than the happy moments of the entire population of Omalas. But there's also a darker way to look at it. The ones who walk away can be seen as suicides. It's the only way to walk away permanently. So that is probably another reason why I thought this was appropriate as a tribute to Jai Woon, because he did kill himself. And he was forced to do it in some sloppy way that led to prolonged suffering. This could happen if someone is interrupted or discovered before they die. I've had two close personal friends kill themselves, and they are both very shocking and upsetting to me. One of them I was very close with, and had been since we were kids, so I took that one really hard. It's been 11 years, and I'm finally to a point where I don't think about him every day. Both of my friends are around 30 years old, so Jaewoon died young, younger than I am used to. 30 is when you tend to look at your life and may see that your peers have surpassed you or left you behind. Both of them had sort of reached dead ends, and they couldn't seem to get out of them. You know, no spouse to stabilize them, no career, no real prospects. My one friend actually was renting the same apartment that I used to live in, so it's disturbing to think of him hanging himself there, where I used to party and have fun in my 20s. Both were successful on the first try. My other friend overdosed on over-the-counter pills. But he had to drive himself to a park in the middle of the night to make sure no one interrupted him, because he lived with his parents. Both of these guys were charismatic, life-of-the-party types, so that's why I didn't see it coming. I don't think that someone who has a YouTube channel called Life Sucks uh, would really shock anyone if he killed himself. Not that I plan to. Uh, I was suicidal when I was about Jai Woon's age. I mostly blame Paxil for putting me in that state, but it was also a difficult transition between high school and college when you're expected to be an adult suddenly. You know, it's a scary time. I also didn't think that I'd ever make it as an artist. My parents didn't really believe in me, and I was always voted the most artistic in my high school, but everyone at college had the exact same background, so that was intimidating. So when I had reached my wit's end, I ended up checking into a hospital to save myself. Um, I did it for the usual reasons. I was terrified of the actual act of violence against myself, as I had planned to slip my wrists, and I knew that it would devastate my friends and family. But. That's really a story for another video. I don't blame anyone for killing themselves, but sadly Jai Woon had a lot of potential, and now that's gone. Early in his career, he knew the truth. He knew how to spread it, and he actually did so. There are really very few people like him. So I like that Andreas decided to feature a tribute to him in issue number three. You know, it was his brainchild after all, and brain children are much more useful than actual children. Jaewoon did an interview for issue number two that I'd like to talk about, because it was controversial even among antinatalists. I hope that you all will forgive me for making a response to a dead person who can't offer a response back. But he brought up ideas that are worth discussing, and even when he was alive, I had planned on making a video about his final interview. I seem to remember Andreas or someone releasing it to the uh, Rogue Philosophy Discord before he died, and that's when I first read it. I do want to state, if it's not already obvious, that I am a big fan of Jaewoon's, and had some personal communication with him about anonatalism as well. I recall him saying, Life sucks. Never heard of you. But I only had one video out at that point. Jaewoon deleted his YouTube channel, but thankfully Old Fan has restored some of his old videos. Uh, you can also read articles he left behind on his website, jaewoonhawang.org. Jaewoon's first controversial statement comes on page 25 of the magazine in answer to a question about philanthropical versus mythanthropical antinatalism. He says, and broken English grammar has been corrected by me, quote, I do think that human procreation is a net positive from the negative utilitarian perspective. Brian Tomasic has calculated that the existence of one human for one year reduces 14 million insect suffering years. If we take into account wild animal suffering, human existence has been a net positive in reducing the amount of suffering on this planet, end quote. To analyze this statement, we first have to go over to Brian Thomasick's website, reducingsuffering.org. 
Notice that the site is called Reducing Suffering, not Eliminating Suffering. This is where transhumanists and antinatalists differ, even though we may both be negative utilitarians. The article that Jai Woon is referencing is titled The Importance of Insect Suffering. In his Philosophic Calculus, he mentions these statistics. Insects outnumber humans in population by about a billion to one, and human neurons per organism outnumber insect neurons per organism by only about a million to one. So by doing the math, he comes up with the conclusion that insect suffering should take priority over vertebrate suffering because of the massive number of invertebrate organisms. Yet to me, this calculus is too simplistic and ignores the atrocity that is human procreation and the industrialized birth and torture of animal slaves. Where we agree is one, preventing insect birth is good, and two, removing a habitat is a way to prevent birth, I agree. But now comes the difficult part, justifying not only human birth, but Jai Woon and Tomasic also justify carnism as a means to an end. The end would be less insects on earth, the means would be human procreation and the factory farming of innocent sentient mammals and birds for food. But as Trotsky once said, the end may justify the means as long as the means justify the end. To endorse one preventable atrocity to cure another seems misguided. It seems like with that logic you could justify mass raping women in order to impregnate them and therefore create more carnism, which will then increase demand for meat, dairy, and eggs, which will therefore reduce insect habitats, which will then reduce the number of insects being born, which will then reduce the amount of net suffering on earth. This is seriously what Tomasek is proposing. He himself is a carnist based on this reasoning, and in his final interview, Jai Woon himself said that he has renounced veganism because of Tomasek's utilitarian equations. He previously supported veganism in his book, Procreation is Murder. So that was sad to read. Uh, this is an example, I think, of why some people call utilitarians crazy. Tomasek's calculations miss some important points. Firstly, are insects even sentient? And do they feel the way higher animals feel? Can they even experience a sensation like fear? The answer to the first question is probably yes, they do have some kind of sentience, but they don't have brains like we do. The insect brain controls only a small set of functions that allow them to exist, but their nervous system is entirely separate. Insect lives are also incredibly brief, meaning their suffering, if present, is short. So even though they are animals with neurons, they are very simple animals. I don't consider the suffering of an ant to be on par with the suffering of a possum. So you cannot put both equally into a utilitarian equation and expect a rational answer, which is where this fails in my opinion. But I do realize that the question Thomasic asks is how many insects are worth one possum. I honestly don't know, and I don't think anyone else does at this point, despite Thomasic's claims. He cites the size of an insect brain compared to their body size, in other words, brains versus the size of other organs should be a consideration. He also makes a claim that the sheer volume of insects should add to their significance as intelligent, conscious creatures. Kind of like saying a hive mind of bees or ants represents a greater consciousness, even though the individuals may be simple chemical robots. But is the suffering of a billion ants really equal to the suffering of one pig in a slaughterhouse? We know that insect life is very brief and their perception is limited. Another problem with this view of veganism is that it's too binary. It's either we continue to rape and murder animals in concentration camps for the purpose of preventing the birth of insects, or we lessen or eliminate our rape and murder of animals, allowing more insects to come into existence. But he is ignoring the third option, which is that we can end the animal holocaust, let all of those species go extinct, and manually destroy wild animal and insect habitats directly on purpose, rather than supporting an obviously unethical industry. Tomasic says that while it is uncertain that insects have feelings, we should take a precautionary approach towards them. But the thing is, vegans, which Tomasic is not, already do this. For example, I understand that beetles are ground up to create shellac, which is used in India ink, so I am drawing this with acrylic ink instead. Tomasic has said he stopped running outside so as not to crush any bugs, and yet he buys dairy products, which directly cause cows to be tortured and murdered. So I really don't appreciate it when negative utilitarians make what I consider to be bizarre, harmful rationalizations for industrialized cruelty. It's like missing the forest for the trees. It's kind of like saying, let's have more wars so that all the hospitals can get blown up, and that will prevent more births. This may just be Thomasic constructing an ethical system that allows him to eat cheese. 
I don't know why Jai Woon found this argument convincing. I do appreciate the work Tomasic has done compiling data on wild animal suffering, but what he's doing by prioritizing wild insects over highly domesticated intelligent animals who are systematically tortured and killed is wrong. He also promotes natalism, thinking that the more humans who exist, the more resources they will devour, and the less land there will be for wild animal habitats, and therefore the less net suffering there will be. This again ignores that we can stop procreating and also replace natural ecosystems with pavement or use other methods to prevent births. He also does not mention that we will no doubt be able to sterilize and make extinct species if we really set our minds to it. Even though we are consequentialists, I don't think you will find many negative utilitarians who think that we should use torture to reduce torture, especially when it's torturing fully sentient animal, animals to prevent the births of possibly sentient bugs. But even if you believe that wild animal habitat destruction via factory farm expansion has utility, you don't have to start eating meat again because of it. I think that vegans know that their impact their boycott is having is minimal. So picking up a meat or egg habit again would likewise do very little to increase habitat destruction. You'd really be better off just saving that money and buying a piece of land and then paving it or sowing it with salt or something if that's what you want to do. I've heard this argument before that procreation is good because more humans means more urban and suburban sprawl, more eat meat eating, more pavement, more concrete, so more habitat loss. But I don't know any antinatalists who have been swayed by this argument except for Jai Woon. I hate to sound too Kantian, but there is a philosophical principle involved here. We are in principle against procreation because it's a preventable harm. Procreation should not be used as a means to an end, unless the end is undeniably worth it. As I will discuss shortly, the story of the ones who walk away from Omelas makes it clear that it's not okay to make someone into a scapegoat just to help a majority. It's not acceptable policy when we can do better without sacrificing our well-thought-out principles. It's like the proverb, two wrongs don't make a right. Yes, I could start poisoning pregnant women, but that would have negative effects for society as well if that became a precedent. While it is true that some stupid vegans ignore and are indifferent to wild animal suffering, many of them are not. The reason they prioritize domesticated animal suffering is because their abuse is an obviously criminal act. The same goes for antinatalists and procreation. Just like Jai Woon says in his book, if age of consent laws aimed at pedophiles were applied to parents who tortured children for their own entertainment, then it would have to be a crime. The factory farms are just the low-hanging fruit, and I don't see a problem with prioritizing them because it's so easy to stop it. It's one of the most preventable forms of torture, just like procreation. You can just find a different hobby. It doesn't require effective, or should I say ineffective, altruism. It just requires a change in habits. Altruists and transhumanists think that they can fix something that's irreparably broken. They think that life is something more than sentient shit. It's nothing but waste. So what do you do with waste? You flush it. You get rid of it. Otherwise it's going to stink up the place. You don't flush half of it and then pat yourself on the back. Reducing suffering is like making a sewer system that only works half the time. It's worthless. It's not efficient. It's just as broken as the problem itself. Jaiwoon does mention in the interview that he is still an antinatalist, unlike Tomasic, but his only objection to transhumanism is that it ignores the inevitable heat death of the universe. I think that's the least of a transhumanist's concerns. Life on Earth will be wiped out long before that ever happens. Transhumanists simply cannot justify birth when there is no need to create more need. The harm of not coming into existence is nil. But I understand that Jai Woon was a very young man, and he was still exploring different philosophies. If he had lived, he may well have found his way back to veganism and to the Ethelist version of negative utilitarianism. For me, everything I've experienced in life has led me to this philosophy and confirmed it over and over again. Like when I was a kid, my brother was too hyper to take along and my dad never wanted to go, so my mom would just take me to nursing homes to visit first my grandfather and then my grandmother. I used to think that maybe that end was the exception. Maybe that wasn't how it always turns out. But now that I've seen my parents and others go through it, I realize that suffering and indignity is the norm. There is no positive in life. 
even a life of pleasure that justifies bringing it into existence. The next controversial topic Jai Moon discusses is one that he has become known for, with a word he may have coined, promortalism. The idea that if life is suffering, then it is better to die early rather than to die later. I would not be shocked if this philosophy in part led to his act of self-destruction. He uses Benatar's axiological asymmetry to justify his view. It does make sense when one only considers an individual's asymmetrical experience of pain being a greater value than an individual's experience of pleasure. He states that Benatar is also guilty of the Pollyannaism or the optimism delusion used by natalists to justify procreation, except he is doing it to justify continuing to exist. It's the duration of suffering that is playing the important part in Jai Woon's calculation. In Bentham's original formulation of philosophic calculus, he cites duration as one of seven variables to use in an ethical equation. I have corrected the variables to reflect the more accurate, negative version of utilitarianism that prioritizes pain over pleasure, which is simply the absence of pain. Intensity. How strong is the pain? Duration. How long will the pain last? Certainty or uncertainty. How likely or unlikely is it that the pain will occur? Propinquity or remoteness. How soon will the pain occur? Fecundity. The probability that the action will be followed by sensations of the same kind. Purity. The probability that it will not be followed by sensations of the opposite kind. And extent. How many people will be affected? The best opposing argument to promortalism comes from Benatar himself in the book The Human Predicament, where he concludes that death is a harm, uh, best to be avoided if possible. I agree with the argument laid out in that book. When we come into existence, we really are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Jai Woon simplifies life too much in his promortalism argument by concluding that suicide is the solution. One fact that Benatar brings up is that death amounts to complete annihilation. All of the dead person's accumulated knowledge, memories, values, and activism potential are wiped out forever. If a person's life had any positive value, and that value is lost for good with no way to get it back. That is primarily why Jai Woon's suicide can be seen to have negative utility. He was having a positive influence on the world through his philosophy and activism. Benatar also talks about the deprivation account of the badness of death. That is, the destruction of any future good he could have accomplished. Benatar goes on to say that suicide does not solve the human predicament. It only ends it for one individual. As Amendum would say, a new Jai Moon Huang is being brought into existence every second. His death did nothing to prevent this, but his continued antinatalist activism would have. The works he left behind certainly will as well. And then the third controversial thing Jai Moon says in his final interview is that he is a moral anti-realist. So basically his beliefs were heading closer to nihilism. I don't understand how one can be an anti-realist utilitarian. The normative and meta-ethical positions contradict each other. My friend who hung himself was a moral nihilist. He majored in philosophy, so I liked having philosophical discussions with him. But they'd only last for a few minutes, usually because once I would come up against his nihilism, there is nowhere to go from there, and the discussion would have to end. Jai Moon ends up wrecking his argument that he built up over the interview when he said, and I paraphrase, As a moral anti-realist, there is no way to prove what I just said. He says that whether coming into existence is a harm or not is just a matter of opinion. I could tell that he was headed in the wrong direction philosophically. Suicide is not as uncommon among nihilists. If one believes that there is no such thing as objectively provable right and wrong, well that's a terrifyingly depressing state of affairs. It's an incorrect conclusion drawn from false premises and a misunderstanding of the facts. Even though I disagree with much of what Jai Moon said in his final interview, I agree completely with just about everything in Procreation is Murder and much of his other writings. The fact that his final interview gave me so much philosophical fodder to talk about in this video shows that he was addicted to learning and to thinking about the hard questions. Writing this video was a sad experience for me, uh, as he will be very missed. The tributes that Andreas 
we'll include in, in this issue will further demonstrate Jai Woon's value to this community. I should add, though, that Ephelous negative utilitarians like myself are pro-mortalist if it can be done without suffering. Killing all life at once would violate the consent of those who are interested in continuing their lives, but if a scenario like in the movie Avengers Infinity War were possible, it's also known as the red button scenario, I would be obligated to push it. The amount of suffering that would be prevented would simply be too much to ignore. However, seeing how this is unlikely, we should focus on preventing new organisms from coming into existence, as that would guarantee less harm being done. Other than that, I don't really know what else Andreas has planned for issue number three. I want to be surprised. He did such an excellent job expanding the magazine in issue number two. He went from three articles to 13, including a great interview with David Benatar himself. I talked about this a little bit before, but Andreas asked me if I am self-taught or if I went to art school. Uh, I am mostly self-taught, but as soon as I was in elementary school, art teachers started to notice that I had a knack for drawing, and the good ones encouraged me to continue studying. So I would take extracurricular art classes at night or on weekends, uh, starting at a young age. My dad said that I had to go to college, but in the end, I didn't really need to. For what I do now as a living computer animation, I am entirely self-taught. Most of the professionals I work with went to expensive art schools, and they are still paying for them 20 years later. My parents were good at saving, so I learned from them to be frugal. I paid for my education with about a tenth of the cost of some of my colleagues. By the time I graduated, it was all paid off. I worked part-time all through school and lived at home. I went to the local community college to get an associate's degree, so those credits would then transfer to the local university, and I would save a lot of money that way. And honestly, the teachers at the community college were way better than the ones I ended up paying more for at the university. In fact, I was so disappointed by the art program that I dropped out and changed my major to literature. I'm a writer as well and decided that I'd focus on that instead. But in the end, I realized that art is what I was more comfortable doing, and I swung back that way and kept practicing and learning. College was really just a waste of time and a lot of stress for nothing. It's basically just doing high school all over again. I have worked with competent artists who never went to any higher education at all. But Philosophy 101 did introduce me to Schopenhauer, and I learned a few other useful things, so maybe it wasn't a complete waste. But just to compare, I looked up tuition costs for the Detroit Art School that I decided I couldn't afford back then, and it's $1,500 per credit hour. Now that is after 20 years of inflation, but I paid around $100 a credit hour um, back in the mid-90s, so that's 15 times cheaper. If anyone out there wants to get into drawing, I would highly suggest getting a copy of Figure Drawing for All It's Worth by Andrew Loomis. Just go through every lesson and draw daily. Ask other artists online to critique your work. I was so disappointed in my college professors. Uh, they would just set up a still life or sometimes a nude model and just say, draw it. <laughs> I received very little quality, criticism, or instruction. Going into fine art was a mistake. They're trying to prepare students to become gallery artists a career that's more unlikely than becoming a professional actor. Commercial art is what I should have gone into, but that would have required an expensive art school, and it's easy enough to just learn on your own if you want it bad enough. Digital art was just in the beginning back then, so there weren't many schools that even taught it. Uh, in my original sketches, I had a mother and child walking into Omelas, and a male walking away. But I was afraid that it might look like a father was abandoning his family, so I added a father. I also didn't want Dan Tenatalis to accuse me of woman shaming. It does take a man and a woman to produce a child, and she is right that women are unfairly given the majority of the blame. So then I had to decide who the one walking away was going to be, and decided to make him look like Kirk Neville, also known as Derived Energy, one of the original YouTube antinatalists. He was promoting Benatar right from the beginning, and he helped popularize the term antinatalism. He also committed suicide, although his circumstances were different than Jai Woon's. Uh, if you don't know the backstory, uh, Kirk was an English teacher and he taught all over the world. Uh, it's really depressing to watch his video where he talks excitedly about going to Indonesia to teach. He thought it was just going to be another adventure, but it ended up costing him his life. I show him using a cigarette to pop the mother's balloons. I don't know if he smoked tobacco, but we know that he liked cannabis cigarettes because that's what got him killed in the end. He was obviously set up by an informant who sold him a couple of doobies, and as soon as he lit one up, the police crashed in his door and arrested him. Indonesia has some of the strictest anti-drug laws in the world. 
If you're from Australia, then you've probably heard of the Bali Nine. It was nine young Australians who wanted to earn a quick buck by bringing back some heroin from Indonesia, and they got busted at the airport. So they weren't even bringing drugs in, they were taking them out. But some of them still received the death penalty. And the death penalty in Indonesia is usually a firing squad. It made international news because it was such an injustice, and even the Australian Prime Minister pleaded for their release. Uh, so they could be tried in Australia, but they didn't listen and killed them anyways. Likewise with Kurt, I know that Old Fan really did everything she could to bring awareness to his situation, but there was nothing that could be done. Chris Parnell is another famous case. He was an Australian who went to Bali for a vacation, and he was there for less than 12 hours when he got his door kicked in and he was arrested. He didn't even do anything. The whole point of his arrest was because the cops wanted to pressure him into signing over his traveler's checks. Indonesia has one of the most corrupt and brutal prison systems in the world. So Kirk seemed to realize that he wasn't going to be getting his freedom anytime soon. Chris Parnell talks about what it's like uh, inside the prisons and hospitals there, and it's nightmarish. I would also find it extremely hard to go on living if I was in that situation. Some of my greatest wishes are for things that are completely impossible to accomplish. Like I would like to go back in time to someone's greatest need and give them comfort. I'd like to magically appear in Kirk's prison cell and mercifully give him a suicide pill that would make him fall asleep. So he wouldn't have to live his final moments in agonizing pain and suffering. He went over there to help these people to become more civilized. He went there to educate them, to help them. And what did they do to him for that? They arranged for an informant to sell him a minuscule amount of cannabis, a harmless herb, setting him up for arrest and imprisonment as a drug offender. He received a sentence of 12 years in prison, a punishment not much lighter than that which was given to some of the Bali Nine. And they were smuggling 18 pounds of heroin. Derived Energy had been to over 20 countries in his life and survived. It wasn't until he went to Indonesia that he ran, on, ran into trouble. Needless to say, I'll never set foot there, which won't be difficult as it's on the other side of the planet, but also I don't have the wanderlust that Kirk did. I'm totally fine with staying in the United States until I die. I would like to visit the old world someday, but I won't regret it if I don't. A million people were murdered in purges in Indonesia in the mid-60s. I don't really know why any sane person would want to travel or work there. The only other news I've heard uh, from Indonesia recently uh, was that there was an Indonesian comic book artist named Adrian Sayaf. Uh, he was a Muslim, as most people in Indonesia are, and he was famously fired from Marvel Comics for sketching in little anti-Semitic and anti-Christian messages into his artwork. There are mostly references to uh, Quran verses, uh, so most Westerners didn't even notice, but people on Reddit and Facebook did. Jaimun seemed to have more in common philosophically with Derive Energy than with Amendum or myself. They both appear to have been anti-realists, in that they did not believe in objective morality. As Jaimun said in Procreation is Murder, the way we die, including suicide, is the result of natalism. Like Derive Energy's wanderlust, whether it was primarily from nature or nurture, it was still the fault of his parents, either for his genetics or just the place and time he was born into and the experiences that followed. I guess I am lucky, or fortunate, that I never had wanderlust. I have no interest in seeing Bali, or Japan, or Saudi Arabia, countries that happen to have the most draconian anti-drug laws. I have a hard enough time understanding and obeying the laws in this country. I have been able to legally grow and use cannabis for about 10 years, ever since I got a doctor's prescription for it. So the fact that a good man died over a medicinal herb that I can use without fear of losing my freedom is sickening beyond belief. Paul Firenze, an ethics professor from Wentworth Institution of Technology in Boston, published an article called An Ethical Defense of the Ones Who Remain in Omelas. He says, The ones who walk away from Omelas are not necessarily bad people. In rejecting the suffering of the child, they show sympathy towards the suffering. However, one can easily imagine those who walk away being self-satisfied in the way that many who stand on principle look down upon those who compromise with brute reality. At least my happiness is no longer at the child's expense, they might say. It is my own doing. This just shows how differently people can interpret the story. This academic sees the ones who walk away as suicides, essentially. They check out forever, removing the chances that they could ever change anything. 
whereas I see the story as an allegory for protest. The ones who leave represent those who refuse to cooperate or be a part of a cruel system. Abstaining from voting is another example. Both political parties in this country are pro-war, so the only course of action left to me is to walk away and not vote at all. Uh, this professor's criticism almost seems to be a way to slam vegans or people with principles. This writer faults the ones who walk away in the same manner as David Pierce, the transhumanist philosopher who wrote a piece on Quora.com about the story. In fact, Jai Woon Hwang and Brian Thomasick also made comments to the question, what are the main differences between the antinatalism, ethalism community and the negative utilitarian, suffering-focused ethics wing of the effective altruism community? Pierce and Thomasick used the opportunity to bash antinatalism as radical. Pierce makes the same mistake Friends does, and that is accusing those who walk away from Omelas of being quitters. Staying in the city and playing along with the conformists doesn't accomplish anything. They would campaign to give the child a few more droplets of water or a slightly saltier bread to eat, and they'd be satisfied with that. And here is Pierce accusing Ephelus of being radical for not wanting to play that stupid game. Pierce recommends making friends and allies with religious bigots. They aren't going to be any help when it comes to rescuing the scapegoat in Omelas, and neither will any altruists who stick around. Le Guin makes it pretty obvious, I think, that the ones who walk away have no other option. The suffering child is locked in a dungeon. There's no way to rescue him or her. Just like with the animal abolition cause, the only way to stop it would be to raise an army that could threaten the Carnus, and there just aren't enough of us to do that. The altruists think that by giving their consent to rapists and murderers, they're accomplishing more than the, quote, radical uh, abolitionists and antinatalists. Pierce says, quote, Is the proposed voluntary extinction of human life and the assisted extinction of non-human life a realistic universal solution to the problem of suffering? If such proposals aren't realistic solutions, does promoting such scenarios risk distracting effective altruists from practical initiatives to mitigate, prevent, and ultimately abolish suffering? End quote. Effective altruists seem to live in a dream world, not this world. Extinction is the only solution to the problem of sentient suffering. All life on Earth is 100% guaranteed to go extinct at some time in the future. Transhumanist lunatics think that life is somehow going to survive into infinity. In his slam piece, Pierce goes on to say that the future belongs to life lovers, and that life is going to, quote, persist in the cosmos indefinitely. Once life gets going, life is almost impossible to stop, end quote. This is simply not true at all. For one, the cosmos is finite, time is finite, matter and energy are finite, and yes, life is finite, as if we don't see that fact proven every single day. Life is not impossible to stop. It nearly went extinct multiple times in the history of this planet. It's only because there is so much of it that it survived. We know that several species of bird went extinct in 2018. Through human effort, the smallpox virus has been made extinct in the wild. 99% of all the species that have ever evolved have gone extinct. So much for life being impossible to stop. Extinction is obviously the one and only rational and realistic solution to the problem of suffering. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for watching and listening. If you paid attention, you'd probably notice that I rendered this image four times. Once as a thumbnail sketch to send to Andreas for his sign-off, a pencil drawing at print size where I figured out perspective and anatomy. Then I blew it up and did a clean and detailed pencil drawing, and then I inked and colored that version. That's the way many professional comic book artists work, and that's why this type of illustration is usually broken up into a three-person job. I have more drawings that I'd like to do for this channel, uh, so that is why these kind of videos take a little bit longer to make. I don't have a firm date for when the magazine will be released, but Andreas tells me that it will be near the end of summer or early fall, so I'll look for it in August or September. Who cares if one more light goes out in the sky of a million stars? It flickers, flickers Who cares when someone's time runs out In a moment is all we are We're quicker, quicker Who cares if one more light goes out
do.